compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, good evening, it's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight. The Prime Minister seems to have few supporters. The Europhiles do not want to challenge the European Court and his former Home Office ministers don't think the plans go far enough. What can he do? As our new Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, has castigated the Russians for their cyber attack on the UK, he is also in the US to reaffirm support for Ukraine after Republicans voted against giving them more funding. But will the former Prime Minister's famous charm save the day? The inquisition of Boris Johnson continues at the Covid inquiry, with more claims being made about excess deaths. But the former Prime Minister has firmly dispelled suggestions that he didn't care about those suffering from the virus. And speaking of Boris, State of the Nation's book club opens its latest chapter from one of his former advisers. Samuel Kasumi will be joining me to discuss his book, The Power of the Outsider, A Journey of Discovery. Plus, as ever, our quick response or QR code will be intermittently appearing on your screens in the right-hand corner. This is a simple device that will enable you to vote for one Nigel Paul Farage Esquire on I'm a Celebrity, which you can do without even watching the paint-dryingly boring program. State of the Nation starts now. by my highly intellectual panel this evening, GB News senior political commentator Nigel Nelson and the editor of Conservative Home, Paul Goodman. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the program. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now it's what you've all been waiting for, the news of the day with Polly Middlehurst. Jacob, thank you. Good evening. Well, we start this bulletin with some breaking news coming to us from Kent Police. I can tell you that a 49-year-old man has been arrested after a 7-year-old boy was killed in a car accident in Folkestone yesterday afternoon. That's according to Kent Police. Following the incident, his distraught parents made an appeal for the hit-and-run driver to come forward. Police and ambulance crews did try to save the boy's life, but he was confirmed deceased at the scene. Uh, but at least the news has come forward within the last 10 minutes that a 49-year-old man has been arrested after that incident yesterday in Folkestone, uh, confirmed by Kent Police. Now, another news today. Russia's Federal Security Service, the FSB, has hacked high-profile MPs in what the government has described as a sustained effort to interfere in British politics. The Deputy Prime Minister says peers, civil servants, journalists and non-governmental organisations were also targeted. It's understood politicians had their personal email accounts compromised. Olive Dowden says the cyber attack is a clear pattern of behaviour by Russia and those responsible will be held to account. I can tell you that a unit within the Russian Federal Security Service, known as Center 18, has been behind sustained hostile cyber operations aimed at interfering in parts of the UK's democratic processes. This has included targeting members of parliament, civil servants, think tanks, journalists and NGOs. Dowden. 
Now, the first vote on the new emergency Rwanda legislation will be put through Parliament on Tuesday next week. The Prime Minister has been defending the government's plan today, describing it as the country's toughest anti-immigration law. He acknowledged, though, some disapproved of the bill but said it addressed concerns raised by the Supreme Court and insisted the government will get asylum flights off the ground. This bill blocks every single reason that has ever been used to prevent flights to Rwanda from taking off. As the Rwandans themselves have made clear, if we go any further, the entire scheme will collapse. And there is no point having a bill with nowhere to send people to. But I'm telling you now, we have set the bar so high that it will be vanishingly rare for anyone to meet it. Rishi Sunak. Boris Johnson was at the COVID inquiry today and he rejected claims that he didn't care about the suffering inflicted on the country during the lockdown and pandemic. And a warning if you're watching on television, there are some flashing images coming up. The former Prime Minister was answering questions at the inquiry about parties at number 10 Downing Street during the lockdown. But he said the idea of mass rule breaking within Downing Street was a million miles away from the actual truth, he admitted. That a trip, though, to Barnard Castle in 2020 by his former chief adviser Dominic Cummings was a bad moment. And lastly, hundreds of Oxfam workers are set to go on a series of strikes from tomorrow. It's the first time in the charity's history ever overpay. Members of the Unite Union who work in Oxfam's shops and offices will walk out for 17 days throughout the month of December. They've rejected a pay offer of 6%, saying average wages have been cut by 21% in real terms since 2018. That's the news from GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. This is Britain's News Channel. Can the Prime Minister turn himself to Hercules? For he certainly seems to be facing a hydra. Every time he cuts off a head, another two seem to grow. Earlier today, the Prime Minister tried to face down his critics on the new Rwanda plan and the claims from the rebels that his ideas will not stop the boats. Last night, the then Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick, resigned in protest over what he said was a triumph of hope over experience. The former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, has launched a scathing criticism of the plan, claiming that the bill will fail. Now, the so-called One Nation group of Europhiles in the Tory party wants to keep on kowtowing to the European Court and may not back the Prime Minister either. This has led to talk of a confidence vote and a swift general election, although Downing Street seemed to dampen down that speculation later on in the day. But with the party so divided, how could the Tories possibly compete effectively in an early election? We need a bit of time. And the bill, as drafted, certainly has some virtues. It effectively reverses the Supreme Court decision. It properly asserts democratic sovereignty against judicial supremacy. It is, to my mind, an elegant constitutional bill which reasserts the rights of Parliament over foreign external institutions. But can the bill pass? And if it did, would it work? The Labour Party, our socialist friends, say that they will vote against the bill. And if only about 30 Tory MPs join them, as they did on the infected blood scandal last week, that would stop it. Even if it passes the House of Commons, the current public divisions will encourage their lordships to block it when it gets to the Lords. But even if it passes in the Lords and gets to royal assent, individual appeals will take time, making the date for flights taking off seem remote. Thus, the prospect of people going to Rwanda before an election is looking slim indeed. Does this mean, in a rather unchristmassy sense, that the Prime Minister's goose is cooked? Let me know what you think about the cooking of geese. Mailmog at gbnews.com. But I'm very pleased to be joined now by an immigration lawyer and friend of the programme, Ivan Sampson. Ivan, thank you for coming in Hi. again. Um, what's your view of the bill as it's constructed as a piece of constitutional work? I think if there's difficulty, if it doesn't say that the Rwanda plan will be... Um, uh, that the Supreme Court will say that the Rwanda plan is now lawful. And for many reasons. Um, Clause 3 doesn't exclude Section 4 of the Human Rights Act. And what but it does define Rwanda as a safe country. It does, but you have to remember that the Supreme Court took advice from UNCHR 
on whether Rwanda is a safe country. And the UNCHR are the supervisors. They supervise the application of the 51 Convention. They're the experts. And they've determined, they've advised, and they had my good friend Laura Dubinsky was the counsel advising the court on advisory capacity, and they've said that it's not a safe country. OK, but the Supreme Court could therefore issue a certificate of incompatibility, which the government can ignore. That requires a statutory instrument to be introduced to Parliament to yes. change primary legislation. If they don't do that, yes. the primary legislation stands. Well, yes, it does. But you can call black white and white black. Parliament simply saying a country safe doesn't make the country safe. That's the first point. You've got to look at independent evidence. And we've had this discussion about the will of Parliament, but I'm captive to my conscience. And I can tell you now that Rwanda is not a safe country. Okay. Looking at the independent evidence of the but, Human but, Rights Watch, Amnesty International, But that's a, matter, that's a matter of judgment, isn't yes. it? And if Parliament judges that it's safe, that is the highest judgment available in the United Kingdom. Uh, well, it's about data, Jacob, not just about judgment, because judgments can be wrong. We're talking about an uh, editor of a newspaper who opposed Kagame, and guess what happened to him? He disappeared. Yes, but these are two different things, aren't they? One, one is, has Rwanda always been safe for the political opponents of the current regime? The second is, will it be safe for people going there under a treaty that has been agreed with the Rwandan government? Now, as one is future, mm -hmm. it is a matter of judgment as to whether you think the Rwandans will maintain their commitments and will ensure that people sent there are safe. And that's surely a judgment that a government, an executive, is entitled to make. On human rights law, on human rights protection, the court's entitled to make that judgment. But not and the court's Parliament... decided, having taken advice from the experts on this, the UNCHR, that it isn't. But, and but... I don't think they've been, they've been convinced otherwise uh, by the uh, look, by so... Parliament declaring that uh, it is. I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. courts only have the right in this country to judge on the law that Parliament has passed. The, the... International law cannot be judged on by a UK court unless yes. Parliament has brought that into UK law. Indeed. Now, Parliament is saying Rwanda is safe. The courts have to accept that. Otherwise, they would be acting unconstitutionally. Well, the treaty doesn't say that. If you look at Clause 4, it allows an individual to go to the European Court of Human Rights and say, well, it isn't safe for me. Yes. But that, but that isn't a right that's taken away in the bill either. Yes. Now, there are some people who are arguing that that right should be taken away, but I'm not uncomfortable with that. That seems to me to be in line with um, Article 40 of the Magna Carta that says no man shall be denied justice. Yes, but and also, you can't exclude the European courts. Why? Because it underpins the Good Friday Agreement. It underpins the trade and cooperation agreements between the EU and the UK. So even if Sunak wanted to exclude... The, the European Court, he can't. You can clearly exclude the European Court from people who don't have any right to be in this country because that doesn't have any effect on Northern Ireland. They're not in Northern Ireland, they're not going to Northern Ireland, they're not Northern Ireland people. And the reason for having uh, the European Convention apply to the Good Friday Agreement is because of relations between people within Northern Ireland. It's not to do with refugees. No, I understand that, but no Act of Parliament that we can enact can exclude those courts' jurisdiction. And ultimately, Jacob, what's going to happen is the individuals will go to the European Court of Human Rights. That's where we're going to end up. And there's going to be a day when the government's going to have to make but a decision whether to apply the judgment of the European yeah, Court. And that's the key point. They would have to apply a judgment. Yes. They don't have to follow the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, as we didn't on prisoners' voting rights for, what, about 15 years? Yes. And indeed, look, Article f uh, Clause 5 of the... New legis legisl proposed legislation also allows ministers to have the final say on the interim uh, applications under Rule 39. So it'll be interesting to see what ministers do, because when the applicants run off to the European Court of Human Rights and we get an interim th uh, th Rule 39 decision, what will ministers do? We'll wait and see. I hope they'll ignore it. But thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, here's a reminder of what the Prime Minister had to say earlier today as he swiped away the critics of his new Rwanda bill. The proof is in the pudding, right? I'm not about talking, I'm about action. The numbers of people crossing from exactly where you were to the UK are down by a third. They quadrupled in the last few years and they're up everywhere else. So that should tell you, tell me and tell the country that what we're doing is working. It is making a difference, but we've got to finish the job. That's why this legislation is so important. That's why we've worked so hard on it. I'm absolutely confident that it's the right approach. It's the toughest ever approach. It will close down all the avenues that people have used in the past. And crucially, as I said, it is the only approach.
I'm joined now by my panel, GB News' senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson, and the editor of Conservative Home, Paul Goodman. Um, Paul, you've written today about the prospect of an early general election. Is that um, Rishi Sunak's way out of this, or does that make things worse? Certainly, I think, not what he wants to do. I don't think he wants to fight a, a general election on illegal immigration. I think he feels now he has to fight a general election on better the devil you know versus time for a change on a sort of traditional election platform. But we may well be going there because regardless of what happens to this bill in the Commons, as you were saying earlier, it's very hard to see it getting through the Lords. And if it does get through the Lords, there will be a mass of appeals to the court. Or the, or the courts. So whether or not we get flights before the election to Rwanda is, is, is very doubtful. If it can't get through the Lords, what does Rishi Sunak do then? Does he simply say, well, too bad, we'll worry about that later in the year? Or does he say, which would be the logical course to do, I'm going to have to take this to the people? So try and make it a peers versus the people election. Well, I don't think he wants to do that, but the logic of where he's got to with this Rwanda scheme means he might have to. Do you think there's any chance that would work? Sorry? The peers against the people election. Do you think that is a winnable proposition? I think the election will be... Although it would be difficult for Labour dealing with Ill illegal migration, you have to stand back and look at the bigger picture, which is, you know, the Conservatives have been in for 13 years, they've won four elections, time for a change is a, is a very powerful argument, and, you know, as a sitting Conservative MP, you'll have to go out and deal with that. So I'm a bit doubtful, given everything that's happened in the last 13 years, given Covid, given the Ukraine war, given the collapse in living standards, I'm very doubtful you could fight an election on a single issue. And Nigel, it's easy for the Labour Party, isn't it? It can just sit back and pose, vote against second reading, obstruct in the Lords, be as difficult as possible, doesn't need to come up with a policy. Um, you can just wait and see. Well, they have got a policy, but you're absolutely right. They can also just, just sit back. Have they got a policy? What is it? Well, I mean, they've certainly got a policy on, Ill on illegal, illegal migration. What, you take even more people from France? That was their latest <laughs> that version. Is a, that, as you well know, Double the numbers. is a total nonsense. The Prime Minister keeps repeating that calumny, and it's absolutely <laughs> untrue. It just does not stack up. It was something thought up by CCHQ which really doesn't work. So that policy is... What? No, I mean, the, the, it doesn't mean it'll work, but I mean, um, uh, what they would have is they would have a proper settlement scheme which would actually discourage people um, from uh, going to Calais to cross the Channel. You would uh, get get rid of the backlog. But at the moment, although Rishi Sunak is boasting about the legacy backlog, we're still, we're still some time behind. So, you know, get it to a kind of um, Spanish five months or a German six months, something like that, to clear the backlog. Um, they're talking talking about using the Rwanda money for a dedicated police unit to deal with the uh, smuggling gangs. Now, I don't know all those things will work, but the point I'm making is there is a policy there. And, Paul, what do you think about the opposition to Rishi Sunak's bill, the claims that it doesn't go far enough? How practical would it have been for him to go further, considering the arithmetic in the House of Commons? There are also now claims from the Tory left that it goes too far. So, uh, Rishi Sudak is in a, a difficult position. And you were talking a few moments ago about the bill in really fairly complementary terms. Um, from the point of view of the Tory right, it does d say that the measures are, are not compatible in all cases with the Human Rights Act. It does say, as you were saying earlier, that um, the government would be prepared to defy a temporary ruling by the European Court. So, Rishi Sunak is trying to pull off a difficult balancing act here. Now, you will be as good a judge as I, or better, about whether your colleagues are really going to come together to vote this down at second reading. Uh, as I see here, I'm, I'm a bit doubtful about that, but we will see. And Tory members, I mean, you had a disastrous poll for the government earlier this week. When we last did a survey on leaving the ECHR, seven out of ten respondents to our survey, and it's a survey of party members, favoured leaving the Leaving, ECHR. and the Prime Minister's poll rating, calypso collapso. There are a number of reasons for that. That's not, I think, principally to do with the Rwanda scheme. That is to do with the general state of the government, and in particular, with the very difficult situation the 
government's got into about legal migration, where really it's done a pretty substantial policy U-turn in the last week to a restrictive policy from a fairly liberal one. And, and that's right, isn't it, Nigel, that um, the legal migration was actually a bigger problem numerically. And Labour here is in more difficulties because it's saying that it doesn't like what the government's doing, but surely it doesn't want to go into election with unlimited legal migration as its policy. No, and I think that, that on the basis that the cornerstone um, of the measures to curb legal migration would nick from Labour in the first place, which was the 20%, um, the so that employers can no longer employ cheap Labour, um, I would imagine that, that what a Labour government will do, and it, we haven't got long to wait now, um, will actually keep those measures in place. The measures that have been announced by James Cleverley will probably stay. So they found us bathing and stolen our clothes. Anyway, thanks for my panel. Coming up, amidst an alleged Russian cyber attack, the former Prime Minister, now our new Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, is on a mission to revamp support for Ukraine in the United States. But will his credentials hold sway in Washington? And don't forget, the seemingly unstoppable tide of a creeping cashless society has been overturned by the defiant masses of the United Kingdom. Are we to find masses, do you think? exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you... <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. <laughs> Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Welcome back. I'm still Jacob rees -Mogg, and this is State of the Nation. We've been discussing Tory turmoil and the Rwanda plan. You've been sending in your views. Alan says... Hi, Jacob. Rishi Sunak has completely and totally cooked his goose on the Rwanda fiasco. He needs to go now. Well, I must confess that is not my view. Veronica says, Dear Sir Jacob, I want to see Conservatives sticking together behind the PM and not running towards the cliff 
like lemmings. And Peter says, Jacob, have you considered doing a narration of a children's story? As your voice reminds me of the late Oliver Postgate, who narrated Nog in the Nog, one of my favourite stories from when I was a child and when the BBC made great programmes. Well, Peter, thank you very much. I haven't actually considered uh, changing career and becoming a narrator of children's stories, tempting though that may be, and people may prefer me to do that than to be a politician, but answers on a postcard. Um, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, has flown to Washington, D.C., and incidentally, the D.C. stands for the District of Columbia, not David. Cameron. Cities have not yet been named in his honour. Um, he has told talks with his American counterparts on a range of international issues, including the wars in both Israel and Ukraine, as well as meeting members of Congress from both Republican and Democratic parties. Expected to be on Lord Cameron's agenda for these meetings is the opposition from Senate Republicans to the President's, uh, President Biden's aid package of $106 billion for both Ukraine and Israel. Republicans have cited a lack of essential new immigration restrictions to balance domestic security with foreign aid to justify their approach. However, the backlash towards foreign aid for Ukraine is not new within the American right. Since the war broke out in February 22, right-wing voices such as Tucker Carlson have taken an America-first approach to foreign aid. But these isolationist ideas seem to be gaining support as the war grinds inexorably on. The Foreign Office said part of Lord Cameron's diplomatic mission to the US capital is to reaffirm unwavering support for Ukraine. So is this stirring of discontent towards the principle actually a threat to historic UK-US relations? Well, uh, with me now is the chairman uh, of the Republicans overseas in the UK, Greg Swanson. Greg, Great. thank you for coming in once more. You're always welcome visitor here. Um, from a British point of view, it's the Conservative Party that led the support for Ukraine. It was Boris Johnson who did this. And our friends in the Republican Party now seem to want to let Ukraine hang out to dry. Yeah, Can this be right? There's some concern. I don't think the party in general wants to let Ukraine hang out to dry. In fact, the majority of senators are for it, and specifically Mitch McConnell, who's the minority leader. So the Senate is behind Ukraine and wants to support it. There are There is a wing of the, of the Republican House, where they have the majority, that has some concerns. The incrementalism that Biden has, has executed uh, during the whole conflict, the, the lack of vision on what's the end game, what, what does winning really mean, you know. So I think there's some concerns, but it's not the majority. And I think, there, yes, there is a wing of the party that has pushed back. But Mike Johnson, for example, the new, the new uh, Speaker of the House, he is for supporting Ukraine. But I think it's a little tone deaf of uh, David Cameron to not consider the fact that taxpayers are concerned about costs because of the the reckless spending by the Biden administra administration the last almost three years. But also, the open border is a complete disaster. You know, Biden's polling at 32 on immigration and the border. He's, he's polling only at 40 on just about everything else, or, or high 30s. But, you know, he's, he's really got a problem. This is something that Biden can solve. So could you explain for me how this works? Because aid to Ukraine and the Mexican border don't yeah. seem directly related. What's going on in Congress that brings the two together? It, it, it really is just, you know, what are the most important issues? And the Biden administration has created the border. And, and yet he refuses to acknowledge that there's a problem, which is, which is unthinkable. We have 8 million uh, illegal immigrants in the last three years. It'll be 10 at the end of Biden's first term. So, you know, this is a real disaster. So there's frustration on the right that the president refuses to address this and the Democrats in the House and Senate. So there is some frustration. Yes, it's apples and oranges. They, they shouldn't necessarily be related. But this is an easy win for Biden because all he has to do is make a concession on the border, on some simple border policies that will stop this, cra this crazy immigration. And it's a win because it'll help him in the general election with, with the independents and the moderates. And at the same time, it'll get his money for Ukraine. Win, okay. win. Okay, except he could look at it the other way around and say, the Republicans want to help Ukraine. Yeah. They don't want Russia to win. Yeah. And therefore, if I hold firm, the Republicans will have to allow us to have this money, and particularly Israel, where the Republicans have been Absolutely. much more supportive of Israel yeah. than the Democrats. And a much smaller number, of course. But but I think, again, you know, there's over 100 billion has gone already to Ukraine. He's pitching another 61. You know, David Cameron made a good point in one of his talks that, you know, it is the most powerful economy in the world. It is the greatest military in the world. 
But there's limits to that. And I think the, the voters are, be, are really frustrated with this lack of interest in, in any kind of constraints on spending. But generally speaking, this could be passed tomorrow if they would just make some compromise. So all this talk that Biden had in the campaign, I'm the compromise guy. I can work with the other side. This is an opportunity. Just make some concessions on the border. It doesn't have to give the Republicans everything. Just give them something. And does the Russian cyber attack change people's view in any way and that Russia looks more dangerous to all of us, not just to Ukraine? It, I think that will be a factor, and I think it's about time. I mean, you know, I'm surprised it took this long for the announcement today. But this is kind of old news for us in the, in the U.S. because there was some tampering in 2016 when some Russians hacked into Hillary Clinton's emails and released them. Uh, that, but there's some credibility issues here with the West, and there's also kind of a boy who cried wolf moment. The, the Russia collusion hoax was a complete fabrication made up by the Hillary Clinton campaign and spread by current national security advisor Jake Sullivan. The, the 51 former intelligence officials that said that the Hunter Biden laptop was looked and smelled like Russian disinformation, that was a fabrication by the Biden campaign and Anthony Blinken, who's now Secretary of State. So, you know, this is something that Americans will probably just look at it and say, yeah, OK, the Russians can't trust them, but we've made up a lot of stuff about them. And to what extent do we, talking we Brits, um, overestimate the influence that we're likely to have? David Cameron goes yeah. out, he's very charming, very yeah. polished, highly intellectual. Sure. Do people think, oh, goodness, the British Foreign Secretary's come and that's interesting, or do they think, um, their defense budget's a fraction of ours. They need to ante up if we're going to take them seriously. I, I think it's more the challenge is that most Americans probably don't know who he is. You know, I'm almost they know who Boris that, is. Well, yes, of course, but because he was front page news quite a bit. Um, but I think, it, look, I think it's good that, that uh, David Cameron, the, any, any foreign secretary from the UK, to be over in Washington, to, to keep that relationship warm. I, so I think that's a good move. But do the voters and even most of the, the congressmen really care what his view is without acknowledging, he, you know, he did say, I don't want to get involved with how Congress works, but without acknowledging the frustration of the taxpayers with the reckless spending and the, the open border, which makes the the boat crisis here look like a rounding. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, the 10 million, that's bigger than 10 all million, 20 yeah. states. 10 million is a lot. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Good Coming up. Thank you. The inquisition of Boris Johnson ensues with suggestions that he simply didn't care about those suffering from COVID. Plus, the State of the Nation Book Club returns with one of Boris's former advisors. Thank you. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. 
GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London-Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Is ready. Welcome back. I remain Jacob Rees Mogg, and this remains State of the Nation. We've been discussing Lord Cameron's mission to salvage US support for Ukraine, and you have some strong views on this. Pat says Cameron may have been a Remainer, but he was a good negotiator and diplomat. Foreign Secretary is the right job for him, and he's done great in the USA. I'm not sure he was a brilliant negotiator after his efforts in the European Union um, prior to Brexit, but leave that to one side. And Steve says, how can Rishi Sunak expect any of us to take him seriously when he just appoints his mates to jobs when no one else wants them? Cameron is just a failed has-been. Oh, dear. That's rather harsh, I think, on poor old David Cameron, who um, may not be a bean, but he, I think he's rather a good egg. Um, Sweden seems to get so many COVID-related issues right. It has not only seen its soft-touch public health policy vindicated, as more and more evidence emerges, it also completed its own COVID inquiry well over a year ago, and it cost reported £25 million. Meanwhile, our COVID inquiry has accumulated costs of over £100 million before it even began, with many more millions of pounds expected to be spent. Our inquiry, with our verbose KCs, is expected to last until 2027. No doubt, to protect their hourly fees, they're asking people to speak more slowly because then it takes even more time. And today was no different. When they took a break for lunch, Baroness Hallett expressed a wish for Boris Johnson to slow down. But with 2027 as the expected finish date, I think Boris and all the other witnesses ought to speak like Pinky and Perky as quickly as they possibly can to save a bit of time and money. But back with me, my panel, GB News' senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson, and the editor of Conservative Home, Paul Goodman. Um, Nigel, how do you think Boris has done in this? Um, well, I'm normally a Boris critic. I think he's done rather well. Um, I mean, there are, uh, there are some bits where he misses out on detail, but that's very Boris-like. Uh, his memory seems to be a bit, uh, a bit tricky, but then he's been bombarded with dates which must be quite difficult to recollect what happened on those dates. What I've liked about it is that I think that he's giving the kind of evidence this inquiry needs. The whole point of the exercise is not to blame anyone, it's to get a blueprint out of this that will uh, means we can cope with the next pandemic. So by admitting where mistakes were made, today he admits that the tier system uh, failed. Um, uh, uh, he was defending Eat Out to Help Out. I was surprised about that, but, but he, he did defend it. What is giving the inquiry is a chance to say, right, this is something we should do next time, this is something we shouldn't do next time. Paul, do you think he's coming out of this with credit and making it look as if Downing Street had a more serious decision-making process than perhaps came out from some rather foul-mouthed um, WhatsApp messages? It depends what your presumption is. If your presumption is that the entire system is wrong, that all politicians are always wrong about everything, and that everything this government did was automatically wrong, you won't be impressed by Boris Johnson's evidence. Um, if, if you take a different view, um, you would think that some things went badly wrong during COVID, and some things like the vaccines went rather better. But it was, after all, the worst pandemic in what? A uh, 100 years, and no country was going to get through it unscathed. So I think, you know, Boris Johnson made 
rather a good case today and like you I'm rather skeptical of the way this inquiry is unfolding. Well because the inquiry does seem to have decided at the very beginning that it wants to come to the conclusion that we should have locked down earlier and for longer whereas when you look at New Zealand and China locking down forever didn't work. Well, I mean, we will have to wait for the report of the inquiry to, fi uh, to find out. Um, and there is obviously some evidence that they received, not least from Matt Hancock, uh, that had we locked down three weeks earlier, we would, have actually, we would have saved lives and possibly not had to close schools the way we did. That's the Matt Hancock version of things. The whole thing is that that's the evidence the, that the inquiry must take into account. Yeah, but, but the case he yesterday got some of the evidence wrong because he said we had the worst death rate in everywhere other than Italy in Europe. He then corrected himself to say Western Europe. But actually, when you look at the excess deaths, that's not true. So, I'm sorry, what is the point you're, you're making? Well, the, the, the KC, who ought to know better, is pushing a line that he ought to have studied properly before asking these questions. Oh, it's I'm actually sure wrong. That's right. You know, I mean, I mean, obviously, he shouldn't be getting his, his it, figures it, wrong. No, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I was talking about the more defending the wider inquiry and what the intention of the inquiry is. And that's why Boris Johnson's ev uh, evidence I found quite impressive over the last, few, last couple of days because certainly if I was, was writing a report from that, I'd be looking at those things that seemed to work, lockdowns appeared to work, um, the things that didn't work, um, and certainly the tier system didn't work, um, and on that basis then, that is what the inquiry is actually about. And the key thing, Paul, is to work out whether people would have locked themselves down anyway without being told to, because the infection rate is falling before the lockdown starts. Well, there's, there's a lot to work out. For myself, I'm a little bit suspicious of all these international comparisons. You're never comparing like with like. Uh, other countries do things differently, and other people have different patterns of living. So it is very hard to make these comparisons. On the inquiry itself, your colleague David Davis wrote an article for Conservative Home near the beginning of this process where he said, really, we should have had a Sweden-type inquiry, short, sharp and dealing with the facts. And after that, if we liked, we could have had a bigger inquiry into who should be blamed. But it would have been important to try to get the lessons learned quickly, not in 2027, at the costs you raised. Thank you. Well, before the break, I thought it only right to touch on some interesting news. It's emerged that cash usage in Britain is up for the first time in 10 years. What seemed to be an unstoppable tide posed by technology and big business interests has seemingly been overturned by the masses. And this good news is coupled with the fact that new plans could ban banks from closing branches in areas with no cash machines. So for now at least, cash lives on. So we asked the great people of Hull if they prefer cash or card, and the people... Vox Popular, Vox Day have spoken. Both, really. Because, uh, some shops don't take cash, some shops don't take card. Card, really. Easier, quicker. I've always used cash. It was, it was only for COVID, COVID and all that. Well, it, it's gone over to card now, isn't it? So, yeah. Didn't I work. actually try and use a bit of both because sometimes you can't always get a signal in the shop and the card don't work, so you always have backup. And it is important to use both because the older generation are not used to all the high tech. It's easier because you can't lose your money. Because while you have money in your pocket, then you can lose it. I use both. It's just out of convenience, uh, but mostly cash, I think. It's just easy to carry cash, isn't it? I think I just prefer cash. Well, back to my panel. Paul, this is just the after effect of COVID, and cash stopped for a bit, and now it's come back a little. Well, presumably, people are becoming more wary of piling up debts on credit cards, uh, are budgeting more carefully, and are using cash. What's kind of interesting about the Vox Pop you just did is there's using a bit of a grand word, there's a philosophical issue here. Um, people who are happy with lots of other people knowing what you do uh, and with corporate and state power, they're all for everything being recorded uh, on, on machines. Uh, people who are more easy with individual freedom uh, and are concerned about, say, how small charities work, uh, they lean in favour of cash. Uh, I'm personally um, in, in favour of cash remaining N a staple feature of the system. Nigel, it's a matter of liberty that we need to be free to use cash so the state can't spy on us with an act bill before Parliament at the moment saying the government can have a look at anybody's bank account, they feel like. Yeah, no, I think that that's absolutely right, that, that uh, you shouldn't be spy uh, spying on bank accounts and so on. But um, I think the basic thing about having cash is that if you're in a really tight budget, you can see the cash going much quicker and much easier than you can if you're using a debit card. OK, one word answer from both of you. Nigel first. Is it the job of government to keep bank branches open if nobody uses them? Yes, public service. 
it can be. It can be. Well, thank you very much to my panel. As I told you, they are the most intellectual panel on any TV station across the globe. Coming up, the State of the Nation Book Club's latest chapter is revealed with Boris Johnson's former advisor, Samuel Kasumi's new book, The Power of the Outsider. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> I'm not sure. To join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you? <laughs> it's my new teeth. your new teeth? I, I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Welcome back. I continue to identify as Jacob Rees-Mogg, and this is State of the Nation. We've been discussing Boris Johnson's inquisition at the COVID inquiry and the growth in cash usage. And Dave has emailed in to say, Jacob, the inquiry has just one aim, and that is to find as many ways as possible to blame Boris. But now it's time for State of the Nation Book Club. <laughs> Have you ever felt like an outsider in any setting? At work, in your family, in the pub with friends? Well, my next guest tonight explores the idea of the outsider from personal experience working as an advisor in 10 Downing Street during Boris Johnson's premiership. The most senior black advisor in the administration, he documents in intimate detail how variables such as dialect, assumptions and life experiences shaped his time in the upper echelons of power and how such things influenced his own and others' perceptions of being an outsider. Well, I'm joined now by the author of The Power of the Outsider, A Journey of Discovery, Samuel Kazumi. Samuel, very grateful you've come in. Good evening. Your book is extremely interesting. Um, and there are two bits I want to ask you about. One is your feeling as an outsider, and then the power of the outsider in politics. So tell me a bit about your personal experience and how that felt going into Downing Street on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I mean, I've always felt like an outsider. Um, 
because of my background, grew up in social housing, a single parent home, etc. And then, of course, choosing to go down I mean, uh, conservative, the conservative route when a lot of my peers, you know, joined the Labour Party, etc. And so, you know, that feeling that I wasn't quite the same as um, individuals who've taken a uh, similar paths to me has always been there. And, and so the challenge was how did I, how, how could I navigate that feeling in order to, you know, try and push on in life. And one of the things you say in your book is that even within your family, that most of your siblings are extroverts mm. and you're quite restrained. Yes. And even in that context, you felt you were very individual. Yes, because the thing about being an, out, an outsider is it's a universal feeling, but it feels very personal when it's when it's yourself. So, for example, if you find yourself in the pub and you have a, dis a discussion about a subject that is foreign to you, you may feel like an outsider right there and then. And, and the challenge is not everybody knows how to fully explore the phenomenon, and that's what I try to do through the, through the book. And it's interesting because everyone at some point, in some circumstance, will feel like and indeed will be an outsider, mm -hmm. but do you feel that it happens more to people of ethnic minorities and that that is a societal problem for the UK to deal with? I think there are different types of outsider. So you could be an outsider based on an objective fact, you know, and it could be your dem demography. You could also be an outsider because, as you say, you are someone that might feel different psychologically or what have you, and, but you could also be an outsider for tactical reasons. So I, I wouldn't say that the, the feeling is unique. But of course, for some groups, that feeling may have more of a disproportionate impact on them, particularly maybe, for example, if you're from a lower socioeconomic group and you find yourself in a space where you're the first in your family maybe to go to university, and that might be maybe slightly more material. But the feeling, uh, in my opinion, and, and through this journey of discovery, I found is, is, is pretty universal. And, and in, in your book, you list a number of people who've been very successful as outsiders. I mean, you're obviously one example that Benny. you were... Yeah, yeah, come on. Um, you, you were very successful. You were a very senior advisor in Downing Street. You had uh, access to the Prime Minister and access is, in some ways, power. Um, and, and the being an outsider drove them. But that can't be true of everybody. Some people it must hold back when some people it drives. Yeah, so the challenge is how do you find a way to use that difference or that feeling of difference as a superpower? Uh, and what I found is that folks who maybe are more confident or who are from uh, backgrounds where maybe there is more of a foundation around how to maximise your output, they, they use their difference more tactically for an advantage, whereas those who, who perhaps might never have viewed it as an advantage f find it maybe slightly more difficult to navigate spaces. And so, you know, when I was in Downing Street, as you mentioned, I was very much an outsider for objective reasons, but also because of some of my perspectives. And so being able to navigate a space I've never been in was... Was, was a challenge. And that's important because you then resigned from Downing Street because you weren't comfortable with policy decisions. Yeah, and, 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 and again, once I left, you know, when you're in a place like Downing Street, there is always an event. Events there, boy, events, as Howard McMillan once famously uh, coined the phrase. So there was not much time for me to process how I was responding to things. And actually, when I left, I had a chance to say, well, actually, you know, did I make some wrong decisions? And inevitably, the answer was yes. And were there better ways that I could have dealt with maybe my outsiderness whilst I was in that, you know, uh, that, that cauldron of uh, that, that is Downing Street? And that people use outsiderness as a political advantage. And that's one of the things you also touch on. So Boris Johnson, Nigel Farage, Donald Trump mm. like to appear to be outsiders in relation to the establishment. Yes. Though, in fact, they almost become the establishment. Yeah, and um, so some people choose to separate themselves from a majority or a dominant group in order to seek out some advantage or for, for, for ge genuine uh, disdain for a particular discourse, right? So Nigel Farage, I, I think he, he genuinely does believe that Britain is better off outside of the European Union and therefore he, you know, separated himself from the establishment. But nonetheless, folks who, are, who, are, who understand it's a super, superpower are able to maximise the output by utilising it, and that is the secret, you know. Well, that's very much Boris, isn't it? Because Boris, um, if you look at his education and background, I mean, I'm much the same myself, but uh, um, Eton and Oxford is not an outsider Root in the UK, but nonetheless, Boris became an outsider. He became um, the rebel within the Tory party, the person who never tucks his shirt in, the somebody who doesn't look like a traditional yeah. politician. Mm -hmm. And that was politically enormously powerful yes, for him. Yes, and in, in my opinion, all very intentional because he's a very intelligent man. And, and so the, the thing that I've tried to do through this book is demonstrate that actually, if you feel like you are different, 
Um, it's the strength if you're able to maximise what it brings to you as a unique selling point. And I think this is really exciting because you're saying to people, if you're an outsider, don't sit in the corner and weep, but recognise you've got a fantastic opportunity to make a success and be um, a, 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 an entrepreneur or a successful politician or whatever it is yes. that you're interested in. Exactly that. And, and the challenge is you have to believe in yourself first. You need to be confident in what you bring to the table because once you have that confidence, then people are more likely to also buy into what you're selling. And outsiders help with decision making because one of the worst ways of decision making is having groupthink yes. and the outsider brings in a different perspective, throws stones in the pond. Yes, outsiders can help to challenge commonly held orthodoxy, they can inspire others, they can help to send a signal. You know, David Cameron, one of the reasons why you know, Rishi Sunak has brought him in is because he's not a member of parliament and in, in a sense he wanted to send a signal whether or not he was successful is a, a conversation for another day. But there's so many things that uh, can happen if you can maximise the value of somebody who might be considered an outsider. Well, Samuel, thank you very much. Um, your book, The Outsider, is available in all good bookstores and I'm sure on audiobooks as well, which I like particularly. Uh, up next, oh, it's Patrick Christie's. And what have you got on the bill of fare tonight? I hear another exclusive. Yes, another exclusive. Richard Sunak is claiming that he's sorted out the Albanian illegal immigration problem. Tonight, we show that they are just using different routes. Mark White, our home and security editor, has been in Calais. Uh, frankly, it blows the doors off a lot of what Rishi Sunak has been claiming. I'm also joined by Jennifer Akuri, the woman who claims to have had an affair for four years with Boris Johnson to assess his performance in the COVID inquiry, but actually, can she be trusted in anything that she has to say? All of that coming your way and much, much more. I'm not sure I want to hear that. I want to hear nice stories about Rishi Sunak being a great success and doing everything brilliantly rather than policies not working and from people who claim to be mistresses of great men. Anyway, that's coming up off the weather. I'll be back on Monday at 8 o'clock. I'm Jake Rees-Mogg. This has been Save the Nation and glory be, I'm off to Somerset where the weather will be fantabulous. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Evening, Alex Deacon here with your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Today's rain slowly clearing away this evening. Tomorrow a bit drier and brighter in the east, but there will be more heavy showers and it stays pretty blustery. Its eastern areas still very soggy this evening. Still Met Office yellow weather warnings in place. The rain does clear away all but the far northeast. Some showers come into the west, many places having clear spells overnight. Temperatures dropping to about five or six degrees in most towns and cities, maybe a little lower in one or two spots. Could be some mist and fog around tomorrow morning, particularly over eastern areas, a bit of a glum start here, but in eastern England it should brighten up and then most of the day will be dry here, but elsewhere expect more showers, quite a wet day again for Northern Ireland, frequent showers for Wales, Northwest England and across much of Scotland as well. In the sunny spells in the south, 12, maybe 13 Celsius, generally a little bit warmer than today, but not feeling all that warm when the showers come along and the gusts winds. Another spell of rain then comes in Friday night and into Saturday. That spreads north during Saturday, lingering over parts of southern Scotland and northern England. The south will brighten up on Saturday afternoon with some decent spells of sunshine, staying mostly dry across the far north. Staying quite chilly here, but in the south we should, with a bit of sunshine, get into the teens by Saturday. Low pressure systems continue to bring more wet and windy weather. We're keeping a close eye on this one. Could bring another spell of wet and very windy weather for some on Sunday. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. 
Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. It's 9pm and this is Patrick Christie's Tonight. You don't have to look far to spot the migrants. They're everywhere here. We feel... Mm, yes, we expose the truth about Albanians, Africans and others breaking into Britain in a bombshell exclusive. And it blows the doors off Sunak's fighting talk today. The first time small boat arrivals here are down by a third. In the clash tonight, should the Tories replace Rishi? Plus, eco loons are costing us 20 million quid a year and taking 300 police officers off the street every single day. Shocking new stats raise the question, should Just Stop Oil & Co be designated as a terror group? And Whittaker responds to claims that Nigel will leave the jungle and immediately join the Conservative Party. And the BBC have hiked the licence fee. Well, here's what I think about that. Live from London, this is BBC News. Britain's former Prime Minister Boris Johnson apologised. On my panel tonight, I've got Madeleine Grant, Lord Sean Bailey and Amy Nicole Turner. This is Patrick Christie's Tonight. Buckle up, 